Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to Sunday in the parking lot at Christ Church, Pueblo West. It is so good to have you here this morning. Uh, and, you know, we've got probably another day where it's going to be uh, either 100 degrees or close to 100 degrees, and we've got a nice little breeze this morning that's going to help us uh, stay cool. Hopefully, uh, we've got the tents anchored down well enough that they're not going to go anywhere. Uh, and uh, if you look around, if you're here and you, you look around in the parking lot, you see that uh, we can't see the mountains this morning, and uh, it's because we've got smoke. And uh, the reason we've got smoke is because there are several forest fires burning in the mountains, and, you know, it's that time of year here in Colorado. And I would encourage you to add uh, residents of the uh, stricken areas, firefighters, and all those who are involved to your prayer list, uh, and continue to pray for the state of Colorado as we go through another fire season with uh, such dry, dry, dry weather and and uh, winds and heat. So let's, uh, let's do that. Um, last week, on Thursday, we had, uh, I take that, not this past Thursday, but two Thursdays ago, we had a, an Impact Youth event. We had parking lot bowling. It went great. We had a great time. Uh, I reminded you of that last Sunday. And, and it, it was fantastic, and it was a kickoff to bringing Impact back online. And so we are uh, gently doing that, and, and uh, to continue on with that, this Thursday from 7 to 8 o'clock, uh, we will once again be in the parking lot with the kids. It won't be nearly as uh, uh, big a thing as we had last time, I and mean, we're still going to have fun, and still every, every kid that wants to come is, is welcome. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, a lesson and uh, snacks, and then we're going to have uh, some game time in the parking lot, but we'll, uh, we'll be hanging out right here in the parking lot. And those of you at home or uh, wherever you may be watching from, your kids are welcome as well. Please uh, come on out. Uh, and we'll be, uh, we'll be doing, doing our impact thing between 7 and 8 p.m. this Thursday. Um, in years past, we've done something called Million Dollar Sunday. And Million Dollar Sunday is where we uh, take up a special offering uh, that goes to uh, Eastern European missions, uh, and what, what the offering is used for uh, mostly is to distribute Bibles uh, in areas in Eastern Europe where they are hard to come by. Uh, and so I want to give you a heads up. We're going to be talking about this more in the weeks to come, but Million Dollar Sunday is, is typically the last Sunday in September for us. And so once again this year, uh, we're going to uh, take part in Million Dollar Sunday um, and it will be September 27th that we take up a, a second, we, well, we, we receive a second offering uh, that is dedicated to Eastern European missions and the uh, Bible distribu distribution that they do in Eastern Europe. And so, very important work, and I would encourage you to uh, uh, be prayerfully thinking about uh, what you can contribute to that come the end of September. And I'll remind you again. Um, a couple of other things real quick. Uh, girl time is uh, continuing to, uh, uh, to enjoy uh, wonderful uh, fellowship and, and uh, hanging out on the playground behind the church on Tuesday mornings. And so uh, I'll, uh, I'll let Joetta tell you a little bit more about how that's going when she comes up here and leads us in prayer in just a second. Um, and then the last thing I want to share with you is that we have, um, we have been gifted... Uh, a, a good amount of food, mostly frozen meat. And so if you could use some chicken or ham or uh, a roast, that kind of a thing, uh, please uh, reach out to us and, and let us know. We, uh, uh, we have been able to share with some folks, and we still have more, uh, more resources. So please don't, uh, uh, don't be bashful. If, you, uh, if it would help you out a little bit uh, to, uh, to grab a, a bag of frozen chicken breasts or, or some ham or whatever, uh, let us know. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if you're on watching online, please give us a call uh, and uh, let us know, and we'll make sure that we uh, get you connected with that, that, uh, that food. So once again, thank you so much for being here with us this morning uh, in person or by virtue of the, uh, the Internet connection. And I want to apologize, uh, we had a technical issue last week in the midst of my sermon, um, and uh, everything kind of crashed, and so if you would like to go back um, and maybe uh, uh, listen to last week's message, 
It is on the Christ Church Pueblo West YouTube channel. Uh, in its entirety, I re-recorded it, uh, and so it looks a little bit different, and it's just the message. It's not the whole service. Uh, you can find it on the YouTube channel so that you can get caught up with where we are this week. Um, all those things being said, I am going to turn it over to my better half, who is going to lead us in prayer, um, bringing up Joetta. Good morning, church. Ooh, that was loud. <laughs> I think I need this microphone at home. <laughs> no. no. Amen. Amen. Can we get an amen? Amen. No. All right. So, yeah, we've been doing um, girl time on Tuesdays. It's been lots of fun. Um, we're going to continue on into September, and I'm going to reword the schedule a little bit. Um, so that we can have some evening time and still have some time in the morning. So um, I'll be posting, getting information out there about that. Um, this Tuesday we're having a recipe exchange. So if you'd like to come and join us, bring your favorite recipe and we'll exchange it with everybody. And if you want to copy the recipes and you're not able to come, uh, just let me know and I'll get a, a copy to everybody. So anyway, 10 o'clock this Tuesday, and then starting in September with uh, school and um, my wonderful, wonderful helpers that come and help, they're going back. And so uh, we're going to rework it just a little bit, um, and I'll, I'll get information to you about that. So. Uh, so today in our prayer, I would like to, we're going to pray for schools and teachers, um, just because everybody's getting ready to go back. Some have already gone back. Some are going back tomorrow. And so um, in your hearts and minds, uh, pray for our teachers and our kiddos as we go back to um, a new form of schooling this year. Um, and in the, in the process of doing this, today Brian's going to be talking about faith. Um, and in his uh, sermon series about uh, that's going to leave a mark. So I wanted to talk a little bit about faith. And one of my favorite verses about faith is in Hebrews 11. I actually don't know what the verse number is because I couldn't find it. But it's um, basically now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Um, I don't know about you, but that's really difficult. And so uh, we need to be intentional about our faith. We want to continue to lift others up, and that's more what Brian's going to talk about, is that sometimes it's our faith that will lift others up when they don't have as much faith. So share the Lord with others and let our faith fill out or spill out others, and let's be a good example this week, especially for our teachers and our kiddos. So, all right, join me in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for all of those with us today here in the parking lot, here in the church, and those that are watching online. Thank you for those of us that um, aren't able to be with us this morning. Thank you for all of your blessings, and help us all to be an example this week. Help our faith to shine through so that others, so that we can be a witness to others so that they will come to know you as, as we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
He is so good. And Joetta was talking about putting our faith and our trust. And the Bible says, cast all your cares upon him. And some of the, the translations say, cast all your anxiety, all your stress, everything on him. Because he is our way maker. This next song is called Waymaker, and as we have gone through this time and this craziness, this song has helped a lot of us focus on who he really is to us. He is good. He has a plan, for God knows the plans that he has for you, saith the Lord. He's got plans for prosperity, peace, for evil. I mean, for, not for evil. <laughs> for good, not for evil. For good, not for evil. Amen? So he is our way maker. As we sing this song, sing it to him. Love on him as we worship. May, may that looks like clapping your hands or raising your hands. Some of us are brought to tears. Some of us can worship in solitude and silence. However you worship this morning, just pour out your heart to him, knowing that he is our way maker. Amen. Father, we ask that your spirit would fill this place, God. We are here for you and you are here for us and we know that lord move in our hearts touch our hearts holy spirit move in this place lord Promise keep light in the darkness, my God. 
this next song your prayer. Spirit break out. Break our walls down. Spirit break out. Spirit break out. Break us down, break our walls down. Come on, spirit, break out. Spirit, break out. Heaven, come down. Heaven, come down. Our Father, our Father, all of heaven rose. tell you there are there are times when you know you can feel alone you can feel like there's nothing connected to you that you are just out there and when we're here on a Sunday morning and we're worshiping like that all of that goes away the Holy Spirit shows up and I got to tell you more times than not I got God bumps okay not goosebumps God bumps because the Spirit is active in and through us and you. This is His home. This is God's house. And we are worshiping our King. So thank you for being here this morning. And, and i got to tell you, there is no better way to start things off than with the worship of Christy and, and Zach and Haley. So very grateful for that. You bet. You bet. You bet. So, at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to do something we do every week. And, we, and I don't say that because it's just, just something we do, because it's not. We do it every week because it's important. We do it every week because it is our connection to our Savior. And what it is, is communion. And so if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have surrendered your heart to Jesus and invited him in as your Lord and Savior, we, uh, we say, great, we uh, invite you to participate in this morning's communion. And 
and connection with Jesus. So, I want to read to you something that you've probably heard before. And we find it in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, starting in verse 18. And I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it. And it, and it, goes, it says this, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so, this is one of the last things that Jesus said to the disciples, and he said it for you and me. And I want to encourage you, and I want to explain something to you, and it is this. As followers of Jesus Christ, as believers, our number one job isn't to go to work and provide for our families. Our number one job isn't to have a new boat or the best house or, or to go on those great vacations. Our number one job is to use all of the resources and all of the blessings that God has given us in and through our work, in and through our recreation, in and through the resources He's given us, to invite other people to come and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So I want you to think about things a little bit differently maybe. I want you to think about this. When you go to work, if you're, if you're a, a, an employed person and you go to work, your reason for being in that job, the number one reason is to bring glory to God and to point people to Jesus. The number two reason is to work as unto the Lord. Do that job as best you can, but use that job as your number one ministry to those who do not know Christ. Because when we do that, the kingdom can't be stopped. When we are plugged in that way, and when we talk about having communion with Jesus, that's what we're talking about. The connection that invites people to salvation through the blood of Christ. And that's what we're sharing this morning. And so if you have your cup, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the cracker, the bread, that represents the body of Christ and understand that it was Christ who went to the cross after being beaten, after being spat upon, after being completely humiliated. And He gave His body and suffered that pain for you. Lord, we ask You would give us guidance and direction so that we could live out a life that honors the sacrifice and the pain that You were willing to do, to surrender to for us. Lord, right now, I, I can't think of anybody who has died for me. I can't think of even anybody who has been tied to a tree and whipped for me other than your son, Jesus. So it is this morning that as we take of the cracker and remember his broken body, that we remember the reason he did it. And it was so that you and I, brothers and sisters, would be able to tell of the one who gave everything for us and for everyone should they choose to follow the Savior. So Lord, thank you. As we eat of this cracker, we remember the broken body that saved us from having to go through it ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. And then we remember 
We remember what cleanses us. We remember what saves us, and that's the blood. The blood of Christ is what takes your sin and my sin and washes it clean, washes us clean. It's the blood of Christ that we receive our redemption. Our righteousness is directly connected to that of Jesus Christ. We can't do it on our own. And you know, when we're talking about the ministry of our jobs, you might say, well, wait a minute, I don't work. I'm too young or, or I'm retired. Now, God's got a place for you. The things that you do, the, the work that you do, and, and the way that you relate to others is your ministry. And it should always point to the one who bled for you. It should always point to Jesus. Because our job as followers is to go, to go and to tell, to tell it on a mountain, to tell it in the valleys, to tell it in the desert, to tell it in the smoke, and to baptize all the nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So as we take of the juice this morning, may we remember that it's the blood of Christ that is what has washed us clean of the sin that fills us up prior to knowing our Savior. So let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful. So grateful for your willingness to, to reach out and to save us when we were not. We just weren't worthy of salvation. Lord, we were so unworthy, so broken, so filled with sin. And yet you saw value in us. And your love, it surpasses all of that because it's unconditional. So Lord, as we take and drink, may we remember what it looks like. What love looks like. And it looks like a Savior on a cross. And the blood that is spilled for those who have turned their back. May we too love others in a similar fashion guided by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today and tomorrow be the days that, if we haven't before, we do intentionally adore Him for who He is and what He has done. So at this point in our service, not because it's connected to the Lord's Supper, but because it fits into the service here, we would typically receive an offering. And so I would ask that you prayerfully consider what that would be, your tithes, that is, giving from your increase. Some of you may get paid weekly. Some of you may get paid monthly. Some may even get paid quarterly. And when we get that increase, some of us get paid a lot more frequently than that. And when we get that increase is when God calls on us to share what he has blessed us with, to give back to his work. His work here in our neighborhood, in our community, and also stretching beyond the borders of our county and our state and even our country to reach people physically and spiritually for His name. And He's inviting you and He's inviting me to be a part of His plan that way.
So as you leave the parking lot this morning, if you're here, they'll have, we'll have a box that you can stop and put your offering and your, and your tithes in. If you are online this morning, you can still write a check, do the old-fashioned thing, and put it in the mail. Uh, and uh, our website, christchurch.pw, you can find the mailing address, and, and there's a phone number there if you need to get in touch. And there is even a place on the website that if you choose to do a digital donation or offering, you can do it that way as well. All right. So, moving on. I want to talk to our young people for a minute. And what I want to ask you is this. Have you ever considered that your friends and the things that happen to them are dependent on how you behave and what you do? Have you ever thought like that? That, you know, maybe what I'm doing at school and with my friends has a direct impact on them? Has that ever crossed your mind? Probably not. I know when I was younger, a lot younger, I was all about what I was doing, and I didn't think what I did had anything to do with anybody else. It was just me for me. And a lot of times, adults can even have a hard time with that. But did you know that if you look around at your friends, there's a really good chance that the way they behave is going to be the way you behave. And so if you have good friends who are trustworthy and honest and they treat you well, there's probably a good chance that's going to rub off on you and you're going to behave the same way. And did you know it works the other way around? That if you're a good kid, if you're a stand-up kind of kid who doesn't lie, who does things when their parents ask them to do them, did you know that there's a really good chance that if your friends aren't that way, they just might become that way by seeing the way you behave? What we do impacts others. And it even goes as far as to be something where what we believe impacts others. Think about this, young people. Have you ever looked at somebody who was a friend of yours and they thought a particular thing about a particular uh, activity or sport or, or, or video game or whatever that might be and they thought that was really cool and you may not have said anything, but in your head you're thinking... Well, if John likes it, it must be cool. So maybe I should like it too. And we may not say those things, but we think those things. And I tell you right now, that's what advertising is all about for grown-ups when they, and for kids. When they get sports athletes, you know, famous uh, football players and baseball players to say, oh man, this is the best soda ever. You may not say, oh, since he's drinking it, I'm going to. But in your head, you're thinking that. If that's your favorite athlete, and he's doing something that you're not doing, it gets you to rethink. And not only that, but it rubs off. And it impacts your friends. What we do impacts the people around us. What we believe impacts the people around us, and what the people around us believe impacts us. So, why do I say all of that? Well, because there's a story I'm going to tell you here in a little bit about four guys who carried a friend of theirs to Jesus. And if they hadn't done that, their friend wouldn't have been healed. Because he wouldn't have been able to get to Jesus on his own. And so, when you look at your friends, what you think and what you do directly impacts what's going on in their lives. So keep that in mind. Let me pray for you. Lord, we ask your hand upon the young people amongst us this morning, whether they be here in person or watching online. Father, we pray that you move in hearts and, and give them visions for what they can be, visions for who you, would, you created them to be. And Lord, may that, may that vision and that hope be an example for their friends. May they, may they be the ones who have others looking at them saying, you know what, I want to be like that. And may it be because your hand is upon each one of our young people. We look forward to what you're going to do in and through them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, pastor and former professional football player, Derwin Gray, tells Christianity Today, 
a story from the time when he was playing for the Indianapolis Colts of the NFL. Gray was not a Jesus follower at the time, and he, he kind of like me, grew up attending church, but he really hadn't come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. During the beginning of his time with the Colts, his, in his rookie season, he discovered that there was a teammate on the Colts team who, after practice, would shower, wrap a towel around his waist, grab his Bible, and approach teammates in the locker room asking the question, Do you know Jesus? Gray could only think to himself, Do you know you're half naked? Gray asked the veterans on the team about him, and they said, Don't pay any attention to him. That's the naked preacher. Got to tell you, that's a nickname I don't want. At this point in his life, Gray did not want anything to do with Jesus or a half-naked man talking about him, so he tried to avoid this guy. One day, though, after practice, Gray was sitting in his locker and he saw the naked preacher, whose real name is Steve Grant, walking toward him. Rookie D. Gray, do you know Jesus? He said. Gray pretended not to hear him. He turned his back. He repeated the question but this time at Gray's locker. Even though he was not a churchgoer or involved in any religious group, he gave what he thought was a very religious answer. He said, well, I'm a good person. Gray explained to Steve that he was the only man in his family who had not been to jail, who did not have a substance abuse problem, who had graduated from high school and college, and did not have a child outside of marriage. The naked preacher opened up his Bible and he shared two verses with Derwin Gray. He said, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That's Mark chapter 10. And for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3. Steve explained that according to the Bible... Only God is good. He is the standard of goodness and righteousness. Everyone has sinned and falls short. Now this really disturbed Derwin Gray. He said, Naked man, are you telling me that my moral comparison is to God and not to other people? He said, Yeah. God is perfect. What can I do to be perfect? Steve Grant answered, Nothing. Derwin said, then I'm in big trouble. Rookie D. Gray, he said, now you're starting to get it. You can't do anything to reach a perfect God. But Jesus has done everything for the perfect God to come down and reach you. Gray said, I sat in silence. I needed time to think through what he was saying and what I was experiencing in my heart. Over the next five years, Derwin Gray watched Steve Grant live out the gospel. When his teammates needed advice, they were at the Naked Preacher's Locker. Steve was involved in the greater Indianapolis community. He displayed Jesus in the way he loved his wife and his children, and he preached through his words and his actions. As the Naked Preacher preached, God's love crushed Derwin Gray. He had achieved the American dream as a professional football player, only to realize it could not empower him to love his wife or forgive his father. His fame and money could not erase his sin, shame, guilt, fear, and insecurity. Derwin Gray was realizing that he was broken. He needed friends who would carry him to the only one who could heal him, the only one who could restore and redeem him. Gray needed a friend who would lift him up and carry him to Jesus. Steve Grant was that friend. Oh, it didn't happen right away, but when Gray's body began to give out and he was becoming, and it was becoming obvious that football wasn't going to live up to the pedestal that Derwin Gray had placed it on and that, the, that it occupied in his life, Derwin then did turn to Jesus. And it happened largely because of a friend who had the faith to carry Derwin Gray to the foot of the Savior. Oh, and just in case you didn't know, Derwin Gray went on to seminary 
and is now a senior pastor of Transformation Church, which is a large evangelical church in Indian Land, South Carolina. God, only God. There's a story of a group of friends who do something very similar for a man who was paralyzed and unable to walk. The story appears in the three synoptic Gospels in in our New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And today we're going to be diving into the story and we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. So we're continuing our sermon series entitled, That's Going to Leave a Mark, where we look into face-to-face encounters that regular people like you and me had with Jesus during his ministry here on earth. So please open your Bible or Bible app and follow along. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Starting in Mark 2, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing bringing to him a paralyzed man, carrying him by, by by four of them. So four guys carrying one guy. And since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat that the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Lord, may your Holy Spirit pour into this message, and may these be the words that you would have us to hear and to put upon our hearts and to carry with us from here forward. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's, let's set the scene then. Once again, we see that Jesus is drawing crowds. No shock, right? This time the crowd that is gathered is so big that the house that he's at is packed. It's filled to capacity. We've all been to something like this before, right? Where you go and you show up and the gathering is so full that people are spilling out the door. Well, that's what was coming on, what was happening here. And this kind of a crowd to me would normally cause me to turn around and go home. I don't know about you, but I'm just not much of a crowd guy. But the people were willing to come and to hear Jesus preach and to endure the cramped quarters because it was Jesus. And honestly, knowing what I know about Jesus now, I would be willing to do whatever it took to hear Jesus preach. And I'm pretty sure you probably would too. So by this time... Jesus would have been the hot topic of conversation. People in the area were most likely sharing what they had heard and what they had seen in regard to healing and to teaching that Jesus had been doing. I would say that it's a pretty safe guess that the folks who had had the opportunity to hear Jesus, to hear him preach, to hear him teach, were saying things like, there's just something different, something special, something amazing in the way that he teaches. You've got to hear him. And when word got out, that Jesus was in one particular place and that location became known, people may have just tossed on their walking sandals and hit the road in an attempt to hear him preach before he moved on. Now there were four guys who decided to take advantage of this opportunity. There very well may have been more in their group, but we know that there were four who were carrying their friend. We don't know too much about them though, or what their situation with their friend was except that he was paralyzed. We don't know the reason that this man had lost the use of his legs. We don't know if it was an accident or or if this man may have been born this way. 
But whatever the case, the reaction from the crowd after the man had seen Jesus leads us to believe that he had been paralyzed for quite a while. And those who had come and were listening to Jesus were probably familiar with this particular man and his story. So you see, there, there's much we don't know about this group. We don't know how they had come to know each other. Did they have to take a day off from, of, from work to make the trip? How far did they travel? We just don't know these things. We do know, though, that they were willing to give of their time, probably some of their money, and certainly a substantial physical effort to bring their friend to this place. And they believed, they believed it was going to be worth the trip. They may have heard that Jesus was going to be in the neighborhood, and they decided that if he was ever going to be back in their area, they were going to grab their buddy and head right for wherever Jesus was teaching. Truth is, whether they lived near or far, where Jesus was, this, from where Jesus was, this man, he could not seek out Jesus on his own. He was paralyzed. These four friends, though, they cared enough to take him where he needed to go. But they ran into a slight problem. When they arrived at the destination, the house where Jesus was teaching, there was something wrong. The problem was they could not approach Jesus because of the crowd. Well, they didn't give up and go home. Those who had come to listen to Jesus were in the way. Undaunted, the four friends came up with a solution. And I, I kind of picture it like this. They're, they're standing around talking to each other and they see the crowd and they're like, ah, oh, you know, we didn't carry Jimmy all this way to carry him back again without getting healed. We need to do something. Anyone have any ideas? And then one of them may have seen the answer on the back of a house, on the back of the house, the house that Jesus was in. And he pointed and he said, there's the answer. See, homes in Galilee during this time were built with an outside staircase on the back side of the house so that you could ascend to access the top of the house, the get on the flat roof. So they went back and they carried him to the roof of the house, up those stairs. And once they're on top, they dug up into the mud and the thatch through the roof and they lowered the man through the hole. We don't know if they brought ropes with them or if somebody in the area had ropes that they could borrow, or maybe, maybe they just scrounged for whatever they could find to lower their friend down in front of Jesus. They may have attached belts. They may have, have taken shirts and, and stretched them and tied them to the, the mat that the man was on to lower him. But what they, they probably did whatever was necessary. But can you imagine if you're sitting in this house and you're listening to Jesus, you're hearing the words of Christ, and all of a sudden parts of the roof start to fall on your head and those people around you are, are, are starting to, to look around and like, what is going on? I can only imagine it would have caused quite a stir in this crowd. Verse 4 says, Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, digging through it, and then they lowered the man, the, man, the mat that the man was lying on. Now, some Christians will invite their friends to church but they won't invite them to Jesus. They'll invite them to hear sermons, choir concerts, to special programs, or to youth events, but they won't tell them about the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. These four men knew that getting their friend to the building wasn't the goal. Getting them to the master, getting him to the master was. Many in the house were probably not too happy by what was going on. Can't imagine I would be too happy. They saw these obnoxious guys damaging somebody's roof and then placing their needs, their wants, their desires, and the needs of their friend ahead of what Jesus was there to do. They might have rubbed them the wrong way. But Jesus didn't see it that way. Jesus saw their faith. He witnessed collective faith. You see, we weren't meant to be Lone Ranger Christians. We need one another. Sometimes our circumstances can be so overpowering, in fact, that we need to piggyback on the faith of others. Have you ever gathered people around you who will carry your burdens when your faith is dull? These guys, 
heard about Jesus probably over and over and over again. And the more they heard, the more they believed that this is what they had to do. Paul writes in the book of Romans chapter 10, and the New Living Translation says it this way, so faith comes from hearing. That is, hearing the good news about Christ. They were hearing and they were listening. Now, they were doing. They were doing something. You see, faith creates a sense of expectation. I bet these guys were hearing more and more about Jesus and the more they heard, the more they believed, the more they believed that they were being moved. They were being moved to do something. And you see, if you believe enough, it will get inside of your heart. And if you believe enough, you will be moved to action because of your faith. You see, there's no such thing as faith without action. True faith always leads to action. If your faith is not strong enough to lead you to action, then your faith is not strong enough. Don't tell me that you believe in Jesus and your faith hasn't changed you. If I believe, it changes me. If I really do believe, I will take action and I will be obedient. I will take steps forward. My faith does not allow me to be sedentary. You see, faith is not a passive thing. Faith leads to action. It is an action verb, and it makes us do things that we would not, norm, we would not normally do without it. When Jesus saw the faith of this man's friends, their faith in action, their bold and determined faith, Jesus told the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, did you catch that? He didn't call him broken. He didn't call him unclean. He didn't even call him man. Jesus called him son. He needed to know that it wasn't just about his problem. It was about his relationship with Jesus. Jesus was welcoming this man into the family. That's what happens when you believe. You and I are adopted into a family that we could not otherwise join. Now, these men had not brought their friend to Jesus because of a sin problem, but because his leg muscles didn't work. Yet Jesus knew that there was a deeper issue beyond the problem that they could see. Similarly, no matter how poor your physical condition, your spiritual condition has got to take priority. When Jesus looks at us, He takes the long view. He sees the big picture. All we see is what's going on right in front of us. And frequently it causes us to lose sight of our eternal future. We're more interested in having our physical bodies healed than we are knowing that there's a place secure for us in heaven. Unforgiven sins are more detrimental than unhealed limbs. Let me say that again. Unforgiven sins are more detrimental than unhealed limbs. Spiritual sickness is worse than broken circumstances, and spiritual healing can reverse sin's physical consequences. Some of the crowd that were there weren't particularly excited by what Jesus was saying. Some of the scribes were questioning his words in their hearts. While they hadn't spoken out loud, Jesus perceived as supernaturally what they were pondering. Verses, starting in verse 6, now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Now, this is a reminder there is not a moment that goes by that Jesus does not know exactly what you are thinking. When's the last time you thought about that? Not one second of your life is there a part where Jesus doesn't know what you're thinking. Let that sink in a little bit. That alone should be something to remind us that we should be reminded of on a daily basis. Let me take capture, let me take, let me capture my thoughts and let me make sure that the ones that don't belong in there are just passing through. 
Let me focus on those things that are important to God and not important to the people around me. While the scribes were right that God could, God alone could forgive sins, they had Jesus all wrong. He possessed divine authority because of his divine nature. And he was about to demonstrate that authority for all to see. Jesus asked the skeptical, skeptical religious leaders, which was easier, to tell a lame man that he was forgiven or to tell him to get up and walk? Only God could accomplish either, but only one action actually produced physical results. So Jesus told them. He told them that he would validate his authority to do one, forgive sins, by demonstrating his authority to do the other, make a paralytic walk. His ability to accomplish a visible miracle would confirm his his ability to accomplish an invisible one. So what does that mean for you and me? Oh, sure, it was something that left a mark on this man. He'd been unable to walk, and after Jesus healed him, he was probably hopping and skipping and jumping all the way home, carrying his mat with him. But you see, our lesson here is in the demonstration of faith by the paralytic's friends. Do you have that kind of faith? Are you willing to do what it takes to get your friends and your family in front of Jesus? Those who do not have a relationship with Jesus are spiritually paralyzed. They need you and me to reach down to grab a corner of the mat that they're on and do whatever it takes to carry them to the Master. Whether you're a naked preacher in an NFL locker room or a fully clothed man or woman in Pueblo, Colorado, someone is waiting for you to move toward them. And they're waiting for you to ask them if they know Jesus and in faith, grab a corner of the mat that they are on. Because when we get our friends and family to Jesus, He most certainly will leave a mark. Let's pray. Lord, on a regular basis, we take care of ourselves. We pay attention to where we are to what's going on around us and how it affects us. May you give us a vision to see how it affects those around us. May we reach down and pick up the mat of somebody in our lives who needs a lift to the Savior. Lord, our faith, our faith should lead us to action. Our faith should be such a faith that it encourages others to come to know the Savior that we follow. And may we be willing to take time away from the things that distract us, to travel down that road, and to do whatever it takes to dig holes through roofs, to carry mats down dirty and dusty roads, and to turn away from the comfort in our lives to address someone else's spiritual paralysis. Lord, put it upon our hearts each and every day that if we're not lifting up somebody's mat, we need to get moving. Thank you for your son who is worth every step, every inconvenience, every bit of trouble that we may face. Lord, because it is in eternity that we will spend the majority of our lives. And it is more real than anything that we're experiencing now. And help us to live this life in light of that one. Thank you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. In Jesus' most holy and power-filled name, we say, Amen.
give yourself away how will you give yourself away this week how can you do it can you reach out to somebody who's hurting somebody who is alone somebody who needs to hear an encouraging word will you spend time with somebody six feet apart but will you spend time with somebody enjoying their company will you be blessed so much so that you use the resources God has given you to bless others let God's Spirit pour in and through you this week. And if you are still waiting and still feeling the tug in your heart to come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to join His family, join the family of Jesus Christ through baptism, let's make that happen. You've seen that we've got the, the resources to do it right out here in the parking lot. We've baptized six people this summer and praise God for that. What a fantastic, fantastic thing that's been. Yeah, it's been awesome. Those of you who have been baptized, thank you so much for being willing to, to get in the tank and, and to give your life to the Lord before not only the people in the parking lot, but people driving by. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that we are putting Jesus on display. And we get to do that here in the parking lot on Sunday mornings, but we also get to do that the rest of the week. So let's display Jesus. Let's display Jesus in our lives. Till next Sunday. And then let's talk about it some more when we talk about what it looks like when Jesus has an encounter or we have an encounter with him and the mark it leaves on us. So, that being said, I would encourage you to have a safe and blessed week and please continue to pray for our students, for our teachers, pray for our parents. I also say that with obvious smoke in the sky, let's pray for our firefighters and the residents who are living in and through these forest fires right now, that there would be safety and the damage would be minimal. And let's come together again next Sunday and throw a whole bunch more worship up to the Lord and see what he does with it because it's pretty amazing. We're going to have the offering box right over here. Thank you for being here this morning. Love you so much. You guys are amazing. God bless. <laughs>